Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to our study of international relations. Uh, so far we've been looking at what the international is, that's what we did in the first lecture and we punctured holes into imagining our international to be something on the outside and I invited you to look at our everyday worlds, everyday lives as part of the international. Uh, in the second lecture I took you through uh, the various ways of looking at IR where we've looked at its history from 1919 to 2019. So it's quite a coincidence that when we are looking at IR today, we've, it's been a century of understanding IR. And in these 100 years, a lot has changed in both the object of study as well as the method of studying that, as well as the person who's studying it, from being a Western male-centric Academics, uh, social science, it has come to be a heterogeneous and uh, now has several plural voices which represents the diversity of this world. So in many ways, the IR, uh, IR has changed dramatically for the better and has opened up and uh, welcomed uh, diverse voices questioning, uh, uh, asking questions and uh, suggestions and pushing for a more representative uh, discipline. Now in today's class, uh, we're going to look at a core theory of um, IR and that is liberalism. And in the second lecture, uh, I ended by mentioning a scholar by the name of Francis Fukuyama. And we're going to start today's class by looking at him and uh, we'll look at this long journey that liberalism has made and the tremendous changes that uh, this theory, this philosophy has made starting from Europe. But first, uh, Fukuyama. Now, uh, Fukuyama's book, um, The End of History and the Last Man, is a book which celebrates uh, liberal democracy at the end of the Cold War and argues that there are no further challengers to liberal democracy uh, after the end of communist uh, Soviet Russia. Now that's an interesting argument and it wouldn't make any sense without a little bit of a background to the book. Uh, the Cold War began uh, at the end of the Second World War between uh, Stalinist Russia and uh, uh, capitalist America, we know about the estrangement, um, the ideological opposition between the USSR and the US and this tension, uh, this division of power, this distribution of power is called bipolarity. When uh, there are two superpowers and there is an active contest uh, between them which often spills over into contestations in a third territory, which is what we saw during the Cold War. Now, the Cold War was also called a period of a long peace, which meant that even though there were conflicts being waged between uh, the US and the USSR elsewhere, be it the war in Afghanistan or the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, they were never face to face uh, in a battlefield the way things were in the First and the Second World War. So Fukuyama's argument is that the end of communist Russia is an end to the ideological opposition to liberalism and that compels us to look at the extraordinary long journey that liberalism has made from the 16th century from uh, Great Britain and has literally transformed the world in every which way, including yours and mine, for the philosophy that it embodies. And we will look at that by starting off where the story begins uh, in Great Britain. And we'll start by looking at the East India Company, 
because it is something that it is con which is contextual to our location as a post colonial state as a former british colony which india was and it also allows us to look at the hierarchies of power and uh, the power of philosophy so liberalism starts uh, uh, in uh, great britain uh, with the theories of uh, ricardo and adam smith and these theorists argued that at the center of the universe it is not the state which is of importance it is the individual the individual's freedom is of utmost importance and by individual of course they assumed men because when we look at critical theory and feminist theory one it one has to draw uh, attention to the fact that when all these theorists who we will, who we will be encountering are philosophizing they are assuming that it is man as the counterpart of the woman who is at the center of this philosophy but we'll get into that later when we look at feminism but for now um, adam smith posits that the individual freedom is of fundamental importance that is the starting point of liberal theory and under no circumstances must this freedom be fettered now the primary opposition the primary uh, imprisoning of the individual freedom was the state and liberalism is that theory which positions the individual against the state wherein the state has to let go its control over the individual for the individual's pursuit of art of commerce of enterprise of profit and that is precisely what took place in great britain at the start of the early 17th century when the east india company was formed uh, in 1600 now why this is so extraordinary is the fact that uh, we see a correlation between theory and practice the east india company was the world's first private organization which means that its profits were purely its profits it did not share them it was not obliged to hand them over to the state and the state that we're talking about of course is great britain and therefore liberalism uh, liberalism is very clear about two things the individual and his right to trade and great britain profiteered from this liberal philosophy which is also called laissez faire laissez faire is a french uh, phrase which means to let go of to loosen the barriers to allow the state to set back the state fundamentally limit the state and of course the historical context of this time is extremely different uh, states are mostly monarchies democracy does not exist democracy comes much later in the 8, 200 years later so the context of this time is an absolute state which is overpowering stifling suffocating powerful and one which doesn't listen and therefore liberal philosophy is extremely uh, remarkable for having overcome the might of the state and championing the cause of the individual and we have a long history uh, of liberal philosophy Uh, following adam smith there are two english philosophers uh thomas hobbes and john locke uh, and both of them argue that the state the relationship with the state is eventually a contract which means that if either one party does not uh, pay heed or does not follow or abide by the contract that a contract can be revoked so at a time of divine justice divine rule where rulers and kings and queens followed the idea that they have a divine right to rule which is unquestioned and unaccountable uh, certainly liberal philosophy uh, made a powerful inroad and most remarkably the impact of this was quickly demonstrated in the wealth that great britain began accumulating so we do know that the east india company started off as a private company and uh, after its 
profits began to soar. It was uh, acquired by uh, the state and which then took over the East India Company. We know that at the start of the uh, paramountcy in India after the first war of independence in 1857. But that is a historical story which we do not have the time for at the moment. But the fundamental point that one must hold on to is that liberalism is a historical fight of the individual against the state for the sake of freedom, for the sake of his uh, determination to pursue commerce, art, leisure, business, whatever it may be, and unfettered by the state. Liberalism is fundamentally posited upon the agency of the individual and therefore while liberalism began in the economic sphere, it quickly spilled into the political sphere. If I have the right to form a company, I must also have political rights and by political rights we mean the rights and authority to shape rules which, political rules which impact the state, um, the rules and norms which can influence uh, everyday rules which govern uh, within an administration and therefore in the same state is where we see the earliest uh, genesis of property linked democracy is in 18th century Great Britain and it is here when John Stuart Mill argues for the right to vote as a form of exercising control and participating in the state. So liberalism succinctly focuses on the individual's right over his economic and political life and values that, celebrates that in the form of democracy and therefore democracy comes uh, very organically to liberal philosophy because democracy is that uh, correlated uh, a theory within liberalism where individuals have the right to exercise power over the state, determine their future, determine the nature of their state and therefore liberal democracy is a form of democracy where the state is shaped in every way by the principle that the individual is of foremost importance. Now, we've reached the 18th century and the 18th century is of uh, great importance because it is here that property linked democracy emerges in uh, Great Britain or uh, the parliament is becoming more representative. Of course, we know of the Magna Carta in the 12th century, but from that point onwards, the uh, parliament, uh, the House of Lords and the House of Commons is beginning to be a more reflective body. And liberalism in every way is seen as a just way, as an egalitarian way. Of course, women were still not given the right to vote, but that's a different chapter. But it was seen as an egalitarian way between men, power shared between men in an egalitarian way. Uh, we also know that around this time, there are two great revolutions, the American Revolution in 1776, the French Revolution in 1789, and the American Revolution most certainly is bound by, uh, is uh, fired by the idealism of this liberal philosophy and which is precisely why uh, unlike the UK which has an evolved constitution as some would say an unwritten constitution although parts of it are in a text and have been documented but America very clearly uh, celebrates that uh, limitation of the state and therefore the, com the American Revolution of 1776 is again a celebration of individualism. So what one sees in this story so far is the idea that the individual is of key importance against the state and negotiates with the state and the state has to let go, again the term laissez-faire and not control the individual speech, liberty, free, uh, movement and of course this is underpinned by trade and commerce. So what one sees is by the early 19th century, 
certain states have embraced liberal democracy. Uh, these states would be France, uh, the UK, uh, America, that's the United States, and uh, they are upholding these values. And what is truly remarkable is that from divine rule, uh, faith is posited in uh, the constitution, which is a text. Now that itself is fairly uh, extraordinary when you think about it, that from the head of a state uh, who had, com had complete power, you have now uh, uh, the faith lies in a text in paper and that is the constitution and even uh, and the uh, and independent india similarly has placed its faith its normative faith in uh, the future of the state in a text that is the constitution now that itself is fairly remarkable but that shouldn't deter us from looking as to the 19th century as a period where states are divided between democracies and monarchies and it is here that things get extremely uh, interesting uh, because there is a certain clash of ideologies and in order to link it later with Fukuyama that there is an emerging clash between liberalism and other forms of government. Now let's just quickly fast forward to the First World War and in the First World War it is Germany which is a monarchy. Uh, the king is Kaiser William II, uh, who has absolute power. He is uh, the head of the state as a monarch. Uh, and the, the First World War is largely seen as a cause of his sheer belligerence. And as a consequence, when the First World War breaks out, uh, uh, at, with the invasion of uh, when uh, Germany starts invading uh, neutral states in Europe is when the First World War breaks out and by the end of the war uh, Germany is defeated but there is this underlying idea that it was a monarchical absolute state which began the war. Now this idea is crucial to understanding liberalism and this idea is crucial to understanding liberalism because it highlights the tension between liberalism and other ideologies. Liberalism is positioned on the freedom of the individual. Uh, monarchism is certainly not, nor is uh, dictatorship and certainly not as communism. And liberalism has seen itself at war uh, with these ideologies for the sake of the individual, for the sake of that autonomous uh, imagined individual and what is interesting is that the end of the first world war sees the first triumph of liberalism and how is that uh, that is with uh, Woodrow Wilson as a upholder of liberal values uh, who celebrates the right of people to determine their future, the right of self-determination as that is called. And in 1919 when the fate of uh, uh, Europe is being decided, more specifically Germany is being decided, it is Woodrow Wilson who is the architect of that liberal institution called the League of Nations. Now there are three things about Woodrow Wilson that we must keep in mind before looking at what happens later. The first is that in 1919 there is a clear understanding that liberal states are good, liberal states do not go to war, that is liberal democracies do not go to war, liberal democracies are uh, peace-loving states and would think twice before being belligerent, before being aggressive and therefore for world peace, for the uh, to prevent the recurrence of a war, the easiest solution would be then uh, to transform each state into a liberal democratic state and that's exactly what took place at the end of the first World War where Germany is demilitarized, her king is sent off to exile to the Netherlands but most importantly Germany is declared to be a democratic state.
Now this kind of an idea is what liberalism is underpinned by. Liberalism position, I mean celebrates the individual as well as that is in political theory, but in international relations theory, liberalism is fueled by this um, uh, by this hope, this optimism, this belief that liberal states do not go to war. This is called the democratic peace theory uh, position by a scholar called Michael Doyle. You could look it, look him up. Uh, but most liberal scholars, most liberal philosophers have championed this idea in multiple ways. Now, how does one analyze this? One an analyzes this by looking, by classifying this as an endogamous theory. Now, again, in the second lecture, we looked at this, conf this concept of endogamous, exogamous, and we can see it in practice now when we look at liberalism. And this idea is that the nature of the state uh, determines its behavior towards other states, which means that if a state is uh, a dictatorship, uh, for example, Mugabe's or for instance, uh, Pinochet in Chile, that state would be aggressive and incite war, would provoke aggression and would begin a battle, would begin war, would wage a war. On the other hand is the idea that democratic liberal states do not wage war and for this the historians have dug up data to look at instances of uh, the very few instances, negligible instances of two democratic states going to war. So this idea, this normative uh, idea that liberalism can prevent wars if liberalism spreads is connected to the League of Nations, is connected to Woodrow Wilson and is a clear example of endogamous theorizing where the inside of a state determines the outside of the state. Of course, we know what the opposite is. The opposite is exogamous where the outside determines the inside and both this inside outside we'll be looking at it uh, in great detail in uh, during this course. Uh, but let's return to the League of Nations for now. The League of Nations is the first example of liberal institutionalism. Now that's a crucial phrase in uh, liberalism and that is liberalism not championed by a state but liberalism uh, uh, an institution embedded uh, in liberalism, by which one means that if we imagine an institution to be a building with a certain set of norms, uh, actions and responsibilities and a certain structure, that underpinning theory, it is embedded and of course the word embedded means something which is rooted, uh, uh, the foundations, the very foundations of that uh, construction, that building rather, are steeped in liberalism, which means that its objectives, its outlook, its uh, goals, its aims correlate with liberalism and that is the furthering of the philosophy of laissez-faire, which is of states withdrawing their control over trade and individuals. So if this is slightly complicated, let's just uh, look at it in a little simpler fashion, which is that liberalism so far was at the individual and at the state level. Individuals define themselves as liberal, states define themselves as liberal, but the League of Nations was the earliest example of that liberalism being put in a non-state actor but one which would exercise great control in IR and that is the League of Nations. The League of Nations was imagined to be that international organization which would prevent war by the philosophy of collective security, which meant that it would open diplomacy, there would no longer be secretive diplomacy, states would uh, bandy with each other rather than against each other. And if a certain aggressive state did 
uh, undertake war or disrupt international peace. The remaining states would then uh, form a coalition against it, isolating it and thereby intimidating it and preventing it from taking on war. So the League of Nations is the clear clearest example of liberalism now being an part of an institution and it failed miserably. The League of Nations was in, unable to prevent the Second World War and for valid reasons and those reasons are elaborated in Carr's classic text, The 20-Year Crisis of 1929, where he argues that the end of the First World War was not a real peace, it was an enforced peace which also meant that liberalism forced itself, was forced upon states which were not truly accepting and we can see that in the trajectory of Germany. Germany was defeated, uh, humiliated and democracy was imposed on it and very within uh, about 13 years uh, since from 1919 that enforcement quickly unraveled and we know that Adolf Hitler came to power using the democratic route and was a hugely popular leader and uh, and it is then that he shed the democratic uh, pretensions and uh, assumed complete and absolute uh, pow uh, power within the state. So uh, what we can see is that liberalism is marching along steadily and it is certainly becoming a part of an international uh, structure via an institution and we see this in a full throated way at the end of the Second World War. Now both the world wars uh, see America's participation much after uh, the war has begun. America participates in the First World War in 1917, a year before the war ends. And in many ways uh, historians argue that uh, America's role was pivotal to the Allied powers winning. And similarly, in nine, it is in 1941 that America uh, uh, joins the uh, allied powers against the Axis powers and the end of the Second World War is marks the, uh, the formal uh, entry of America in shaping international politics and it is here that liberalism is truly institutionalized in three pivotal organizations and these are the World Bank, the IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund, and the third is the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, which for 50 years languished as an agreement, but in 1995 was vitalized and activated into an international organization. Now, these three organizations are fascinating for institutionalizing liberalism by a victorious state and that is America. Just as a reminder, uh, America was not part of the League of Nations uh, because even though Woodrow Wilson conceptualized it, uh, the Congress, the American Congress uh, refused to accede to uh, the League of Nations. But things are different in 1944 and these uh, negotiations for the post-war future take place much before the war is over and that is in 1944. So the war ends in 1945 but in 1944 much before the ending of the war uh, at Bretton Woods which is in America, uh, negotiations for the future are already being planned, ideas are being sold and these ideas are completely liberal and institutionalized in every which way. Now what are these in, uh, institutions and why are they important? They are important because each one of them is a international economic institution of huge importance, uh, especially for uh, recovering economies. So the war was 
uh, damaging and uh, impacted the economies of several countries. So these three organizations were set up as organizations to aid, especially the World Bank and the IMF, were seen as ways of aiding economies and helping them to on the path of development and building a stable economy. Also, there was the underpinning idea that states which, uh, which have weak economies are more inclined to go to war than states which aren't. And of course, the historical experience or the historical example that was being drawn upon was the state of Germany, which uh, where the, its economy had collapsed, the, uh, the value of the mark was uh, uh, very low and of course there are those famous images of people sweeping the streets with currency notes of the mark because they were valueless. So the underpinning ideas of the Bretton Woods are three. So the formation and um, of these three institutions called the Bretton Woods institutions are important because they indicate the willingness of America to take on a global role and uh, be a more active player in international politics, but from an economic point of view. Now, we must remember uh, that liberalism and capitalism have had a long uh, intertwined history. Each one feeds into the other and in many ways, America's uh, construction of these three organizations is rooted and linked to its own capitalistic ideals and uh, objectives. What is uh, in, important to note about these three uh, institutions are that all three of them embody what is called neoliberalism, by which we mean that liberalism is no longer centered on the state but is now institutionalized. To give a small example of that, uh, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which is a convenient phrase for IBRD, which stands for the International Bank for, uh, for Recovery and Development of uh, Collapsing Economies, came with a set of conditions. Membership to these organizations came with a set of liberal conditions which were that if a state was to take a loan from either the World Bank or the IMF, this would imply that the state accepts the structural changes in its economy. In short, that if a state was to take money from either of these institutions, it would relax its control over the economy. So a state which controls its econ economy is often called a protectionist state. And what is it protecting? It's protecting its people, its economy from uh, goods and consumables and uh, thing forces beyond the border. Uh, so protectionism is often the opposite of laissez-faire and laissez-faire is where the state is relaxed and let's go of those uh, controlling mechanisms whereby trade is controlled and therefore the Bretton Woods institutions champions two elements of liberalism. The first is free trade and the second is democracy. Free trade is of course part of the liberal uh, theory which we mentioned at the start of the class with Adam Smith. And free trade means trade which is freed from uh, the interventions of the state. So when the state doesn't control what is imported, what is exported, the rate of tariff, and tariff is that tax uh, applied on uh, incoming goods is when trade is truly free. So trade, free trade means freeing trade from uh, the control of the state. And when free trade and democracy are upheld as the new principles of this neoliberal economic order, uh, one can also see how that is close uh, to the liberal agenda.
So an agenda is something which one sets out to achieve with a clear objective. These institutions certainly had and have a liberal agenda which is that they hope to link together the world in an international enmeshed web of trade and democracy and in many ways they are following the precepts of Immanuel Kant and arguing that trade uh, when nations trade the, cons the chances or possibility of war are lower. So in many ways the calculations that liberal theorists at this time uh, primarily uh, Robert Keohan and Joseph Nye who published a book in 1970 called Power and Interdependence argued that trade and democracy are the two medicines which can cure the disease of war and Keohan and Nye's book then becomes a key text of what we called neoliberalism. Right, so what we have seen so far is that liberalism has flowered as a individualistic philosophy in the 16th century where it is seen as championing the rights of the individual against the absolute authority of the state. By the 18th century liberalism has a clear corollary, political corollary with democracy and liberal democracy then becomes the underpinning of prosperity. Uh, America and Great Britain or the Great Britain and America demonstrate as to how a nation can prosper by commerce, uh, trade and enterprise and it is not a uh, uh, it is a link that has not gone unnoticed between the prosperity of these states and their, uh, the economic structures that they have upheld. So it is extremely natural for these states then to champion the spread of that magical medicine which has cured uh, them of uh, poverty and underdevelopment and has allowed them to prosper and the Bretton Woods institutions therefore embody what is called as neoliberalism and conceptualized in Keohan and Nye's 1970 book uh, Power and Interdependence. Now Keohan and Nye's book is a classic text of what is considered neoliberalism and in this book uh, the argument is made that liberalism is that philosophy, that theory that can truly uh, transform the world for collective better and the magical mantra for that is trade. Now trade is often seen as a win-win situation in uh, calculations where trade is one where there is mutual benefit mutual prosperity and also one which decreases the, cons uh, the possibilities of war. So uh, Kion and I argued that estrangement, states which do not trade with each other are more likely to go to war than those who do and therefore uh, uh, drawing states into an international network of interdependence would be the cure for uh, war and uh, violence and therefore Kion and I speak about interdependence as a way out, as mutual advantage, mutual benefit and as a way of making sure that a world, second world or third world war rather does not take place. Now what is interesting is that it is during this period that uh, the greatest opposition to liberalism comes from communist Russia. Uh, in 2019, uh, the millennials and young students are often inclined to overlook the scale of power and authority and legitimacy that the USSR once enjoyed from 1945 to 1991 during the Cold War, 
the USSR posed an ideological opposition to the USA as well as attracting allies uh, from Cuba to India to other socialist inclined states, uh, Hungary, China, whole lot of states were inclined towards receiving funds from the USSR, being inspired by the USSR and in uh, following our alternative axis. So even while Kyohin and Nai are writing this, uh, they are fully aware that there is an opposition to uh, liberalism and that is embodied by the USSR. The USSR institutionally did not join naturally. Uh, any of the Bretton Woods institutions. Um, it instead formed its own alternative institutions like the Comic Con, which was an economic um, grouping of the Soviet inclined states. So, in every which way, even while Kyohin and I are speaking about pushing liberalism, there remains a great dark void in. Uh, a great dark obstacle in their path and that of course is the communist uh, states and socialist inclined states to, uh, states which are critical of the unabashed uh, neoliberal principles of Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods therefore when it started out was a, a, a double edged dagger. On one hand it promised goods it promised resources, promised uh, money, but at the same time, it came with the with conditions that states have to lower their tariff barriers in order to access these uh, funds and these monies. And naturally, the states first to ask for loans or to take financial assistance were poor developing states. Now, that's a very interesting and complex area as to how uh, post-colonial states, uh, developing states uh, were looped into this network of neoliberalism by the sheer lure of it. So what one sees is that during the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, uh, poor states keen to build, take on social projects, for example, the Narmada a uh, dam was built on funds from the World Bank and there are scores of examples of developing states taking loans from uh, the World Bank and the IMF. But in exchange, it came with a loss of control over the economy. Now, while this is celebrated within neoliberalism and liberalism rather, uh, it does not quite have the same impact on states which haven't industrialized or haven't prospered yet. And as a consequence, uh, consumer goods capitalist uh, tentacles began, were allowed to penetrate into these economies much before they were equipped to deal with it. <clears throat> so there are studies as to how Nestle, which is the global consumer uh, goods company, uh, could provide, could sell its tins of uh, powdered milk for young children. Uh, could uh, for, uh, Nestle and other companies began making inroads into these economies precisely because they were facilitated by the Bretton Woods institutions. And there is a correlation between uh, neoliberal policies and the debilitation of uh, economies which are just setting out. So these were countries which had recently sh fought off colonization and were trying to stand on their own feet. And it is then that they were enmeshed in this neoliberal trap, one could call it. And which is why uh, critics of neoliberalism uh, often called the Bretton Woods institution an unholy trinity. So Richard Peet's book, uh, must, which is a, a recommended book to understand the consequences of neoliberalism, is a excellent text to to highlight as to the consequences of that neoliberalism. But having said that, let's stick to the track, which is of 
न्यू लिबरल थियोरी क्यों ही ना ना आई आर्ग्यू दैट इंटरडिपेंडेंस इज दैट मैजिक मंत्रा विच कुड सॉर्ट ग्लोबल इशूज आउट एंड ट्रेड एंड डेमोक्रेसी वो वन ऑफ दैम एंड दिस फेल इन टू द ट्रैप ऑफ द डेमोक्रेटिक पीस थियोरी विच आर्ग्यूज दैट डेमोक्रेसीज डू नॉट गो टू वॉर विथ ईच अदर but that also means that globally dictatorships are then identified as the source of power as a source of unaccountable authority and as the, and as evils which a global politics must do away with so in the liberal point of view there is a very clear good and bad democracies are good or uh, dictatorships are bad also because there is the liberal principle of upholding the individual's rights or uh, the value of life the quality of life are deeply uh, imbricated within liberal philosophy so as the year as the decades progressed it became increasingly clear that liberal uh, liberalism and neo liberalism uh, the tentacles the roots of these theories are truly uh, becoming extremely deep and that also brings us to the subsequent topic of globalization uh, which of course is a separate lecture uh, possibly at the end of this course but when we talk about boundaries uh, becoming fuzzy uh, boundaries becoming meaningless and there being a greater interchange of people goods and trade across boundaries it is important to remember that this has been manufactured by the uh uh bretton woods institutions with a clear agenda of capitalism which also means that globalization as we know it today has occurred in spurts and has developed across time but in the last uh since 1945 there has been a certain ideology and acceleration to it granted by the bretton woods institutions which points to the ideological nature of globalization itself the globalization which we see today facilitates some but not everybody uh, favors some but not everybody and it is these hierarchies which are presented which come to the forefront very clearly when one sees the neo liberal agenda uh, of these uh, of these three extremely powerful institutions as an indicator of its uh, power and authority and influence at uh, at the end of the cold war the ussr collapsed uh and there emerged russia and 15 new republics and russia joined uh the uh wto which was formed in 1995 and subsequently so did china in 2001 thereby completing the universalization of uh neoliberalism so in short uh of the 200 and odd states about 190 are a part of wto the imf and the world bank making them part of a global neo liberal economy which uh favors some and favors others and we will be seeing that again when we look at the negotiations over the world trade organization when we look at international organizations but for the moment what is important to remember is that when the ussr collapses there is a reason that fukuyama celebrates it and the reason is that for the first time there is no opposition to liberalism for the first time there is no ideological territorial uh, theoretical opposition to liberalism and the fact that both uh, communist former communist states uh russia and a uh, communist state but capitalistic within china are part of uh these institutions points to the fact that truly the world is indeed uh 
liberal is enmeshed in a neoliberal institutionalized world where the global economy itself is marked by uh, a neoliberal structure so just to recapitulate this long journey that we have made we have looked at as to how liberalism started off by looking at the individual it then transformed the state itself because the state then limited its authority and civil rights civil liberties constitutional rights are embodiments of uh, liberal rights the fact article from our fundamental rights under the constitution of india are liberal rights which empower the individual against the state that is within the state but at the state's level liberalism within ir transformed into a theory which believed and again it's a endogamous theory that the in the, the insides of a state can determine the outside of the state emmanuel kant argued that there can be a a, a pacific zone whereby states who are democratic will form a zone of peace and that is precisely what we see taking place that democratic states have allied themselves and formed a zone of peace of peace and violence lies beyond that but of course that has changed dramatically with the formation of the world trade organization in 1995 and as an organization then this gigantic organization then undertaking the minute tedious task of facilitating trade across the boundaries of over 190 states so in many ways uh, liberalism has triumphed fukuyama is indeed accurate in saying that there is no opposition to uh, liberalism and it also points to the growing concerns of liberalism and that is the individual so human rights violations a uh, genocide a uh, the impunity of the state against the individual there is certainly a liberal order emerging in international relations we can see that clearly with the formation of the international criminal uh, tribunal formed in 1998 now this again is an extension of the liberal belief that the state has to be hauled up and cannot be unaccountable the ICT with its headquarters at the Hague is the international is the international body which criminalizes uh, assaults and violation of human rights it criminalizes uh, genocide it criminalizes violations of the rights of women and children non combatants and it is truly remarkable in taking on this uh, task of prosecuting and charging a uh, heads of state with uh, violations of law and reminding us that perhaps the boundary between the inside and the outside is now blurring a dictator could previously exercise power kill millions and get away uh, unscathed but that is no longer the case uh, before the formation of the ICT there were two criminal tribunals set up on Yugoslavia and Rwanda where prosecutions and uh, uh, trials took place against the heads of the states against milosevic of yugoslavia and mugambe of rwanda and in both these cases one sees as to how the right of the individual across the boundary is of central importance and in many ways this highlights that the liberal order is concerned with justice across boundaries and not just with justice within a certain state or uh, the ICTY the ICTR and the ICT are uh, hallmarks of uh, the understanding and the recognition that liberalism upholds 
human beings and the rights of humans across boundaries. And therefore, it, it is with that that we return to Adam Smith and his celebration of the individual and that is the crucial pillar of liberalism that the rights of the individual cannot be violated. And we see that with the robbing of the impunity of dictators and the fact that there is now a global pressure on uh, dictators and what they can get away with and what they cannot. And if one looks at the wide array of international organizations which follow this commitment to human rights, we see that there is the United Nations uh, uh, the body of United Nations on human rights, on the rights of women, of children, of the disabled, uh, a wide variety of rights which again uh, uphold the individual against the state. So to summarize, uh, liberalism has come a long way from in the last 500 years from being a theory of the individual to being embodied in international institutions. Today, international economic institutions from the World Trade Organization to international criminal, uh, to the international criminal uh, tribunal embody that concern for the individual. And again, it tells us that eventually international relations is about people across borders, people within borders and bo the meaningless of borders within this concern of uh, the right of the human is far greater than the authority of the state. Uh, so we end this class uh, here uh, at this point. I have given you a wide uh, range, a wide uh, survey of what liberalism has been and what it is today and in the subsequent class we will be looking at another theory of IR. Thank you.